Do you love going to Broadway shows, but can't go now because Broadway's closed? Join tour guide Tim and Velasco too as they bring Broadway history to you. Grab your Broadway passport for what's in store on your virtual Broadway tour. This week's theater, The Ambassador, has looked very similar since its opening night in 1921. In the early 1920s, J.J. and Lee Schubert wanted to create a new concentration of theaters on 48th and 49th streets, so they planned an expansion of six new theaters on those blocks. Only four ended up being built. The 49th Street Theater, demolished. The Forest, now the Eugene O'Neill. The Ambassador and The Ritz, now the Walter Kerr. Who did the brothers turn to for this massive, quick expansion of their theater portfolios? Architect Herbert J. Kraft, of course. Of the four, Kraft designed two of them to be fraternal twins of sorts. Looking at the 1921 photo of the Ambassador and comparing it with a photo of the Walter Kerr when it was built, you'll notice two distinct similarities. He fashioned the exterior bricks in a diaper pattern with thick mortar insets, making the brickwork appear architecturally interesting. This pattern also happened to be very quick and efficient to assemble. You'll also notice the same beautiful marquee sign was incorporated into both. While the Kerr still retains the original 1921 sign, sadly, the Ambassadors was removed when it was converted into a television studio in the 1940s, making these fraternal twin theaters look, well, less twin-like. Looking at the facade of the Ambassador, you'd never know the interesting configuration that lies within. The Schubert brothers presented architect Herbert J. Kraft with a challenge when building the theater. The plot of land didn't allow for Kraft's traditional theater designs that ran parallel to the street. Kraft ultimately designed a theater that sat diagonally on the site, with a rounded entrance in the southeast corner for the box office. The stage was positioned in the northwest corner, allowing for around 1,100 seats inside. Well, this is all disguised behind his diaper pattern brick when viewed from the sidewalk, an overhead view reveals his full design. The theater got off to a rough start with very few early hits. One notable early success was the operetta Blossom Time in 1921, which became the longest running show in the theater's history for the next 43 years. Needless to say, few hits followed. After 20 years as a television and radio studio, the Schubert's regained control of the theater. With a huge hit in Save Young Glover's Bringing the Noise, Bringing the Funk in the late 90s, it seemed that the Ambassador would finally see some success, but was quickly followed by a string of short runs. That would all change in 2003. While Herbert J. Kreps' hexagonal seating plan may have increased the audience capacity, the diagonal orientation created very little swing space to store scenery backstage. With the lavish sets typically utilized on Broadway, would there be a show that could entertain with very little scenery? In 1994, just east of the Ambassador, the City Center Theater began playing host to the Encore series. Three rarely heard American musicals are picked each season to be revived in first-rate concert-style presentations. Beginning with Bach and Harnick's Fiorello in 1994, the series concentrated on iconic composers from Broadway's earlier years. In its third season, Encores broke from the mold and presented a more contemporary show from 1975, Chicago. The original production, while successful with a two-year run, was felt by many industry insiders to have withered in the shadow of the blockbuster A Chorus Line, which opened the same year. The Encore's concert staging of Chicago featured Bob Fosse's original choreography recreated by Anne Ranking, who also played Roxy, simple yet sexy costumes by William Ivy Long, and a pared-down concert version with the orchestra front and center. After critical acclaim, the production moved intact to Broadway, first bouncing around a few theaters before settling in at the Ambassador in 2003. Bowler hats, Fosse hands, and all that jazz were here to stay. Prior to the Broadway shutdown in March, Chicago had danced its way through 9,600 performances and spawned productions all over the world. Trailing behind the Phantom of the Opera, which had opened nine years before it, Chicago is currently the second longest running musical in Broadway history. 
second longest running doesn't sound great on a marquee. So the marketing team came up with the idea to add the word American. The marquee now reads longest running American musical. Technically, they're not wrong. Over the past 23 years, Chicago has utilized a revolving door of celebrities in key roles to generate constant buzz. Jerry Springer, Spice Girl at Melanie B, Ashley Simpson, talk show host Wendy Williams, Usher, Brandy, and Billy Ray Cyrus, to name just a few. But for 20 of those 23 years, there was one constant, Donna Marie Asbury. Just a few months ago, she was awarded the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest run on Broadway playing the same role of June, he ran into my knife 10 times for 20 years. Congratulations, Donna. That's a lot of jazz hands. <laughs> Hello. Happy Saturday noon on Broadway. It is a darker day on Broadway with some recent developments, but it's a sunny day in New York City today, and I'm here with you. And so it's a little more sunshiny, and we're just going to go with that sun will come out tomorrow optimism and welcome to Saturday Noon on Broadway. Uh, every week we're coming to you live with someone who has worked at the theater we're working with, uh, uh, theater we're featuring that week. This week we are joined by the incredible Susan Goulet, house electrician at the Ambassador Theater, which of course we've been talking about all week. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with me or Broadway Up Close, my name is Tim Dolan. I'm an actor, the owner of Broadway Up Close walking tours in New York City. For the last 10 years, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our tours have unearthed secrets, fun facts, history, ghost stories, uh, all the things you didn't know, you didn't know that you really want to know about the 41 Broadway theaters. Uh, I have an entire team that I call my green team that are actors and stage managers that are your windows and your eyes into the world of our weird, crazy theatrical lives. We have five exterior tours. Last year in October, we opened our first interior tour, which takes you inside Broadway's oldest theater, the Hudson, uh, which has been there since 1903. Lots of crazy, crazy history. And that was a dream come true to uh, work with the Ambassador Theater Group and give me the little keys to the castle and take you in and show, uh, show you our world truly up close. Um, for info on all of those tours, the five exterior tours we're currently offering in person, masks, socially distance. Uh, the Hudson tour is the only one we don't have available because uh, of the shutdown. But all of the information for all of that is at our website, www.broadwayupclose.com. You shouldn't do that right now. You should wait till after we're done talking to Susan, and then you should go to my website and maybe join us in person. Um, our gift shop, we have a gift shop that I opened last year in Times Square um, with a six foot tall Broadway sign next to it that has 150 light bulbs, my favorite thing in the world, marquee letters. And so, uh, uh, that uh, display, of course, is closed currently because of the shutdown, because of a global pandemic. Spoiler alert. I don't know if you've heard. Um, and so eventually that'll be reopened. We don't know. In the meantime, uh, everything's online. If you have any custom Broadway merchandise needs, we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, March 12th, 2020. It's the day everything shut down. Uh, in the tour guide community, it became known as Red Thursday. Uh, it's been an insane six months uh, since then, uh, with the goalpost, of course, constantly moving and I have a feeling for those who are watching today, you probably have a pretty good idea of the announcement that happened yesterday, extending the goalpost even further. Um, every time this happens, uh, I feel helpless. I feel crazy, um, as I'm sure you do. And a little part of my like Broadway heart dies a little bit uh, that we're going to have to wait longer. And a friend of mine, uh, Jose, who I worked with on Wizard of Oz years ago, at the exact same time, he had asked for my address. I randomly gave it to him. He sent to me... Um, in the mail, a uh, paper crane. And so I get this announcement. I'm looking at these cranes, which is an, a mystic animal in Japanese culture that if you collect a thousand of them, it's supposed to make a wish come true. And so I got this insane idea literally yesterday as I'm looking at this and processing all the news. And I thought, I'm going to do something about this. We've got to have some action in the world. And so I started a thing yesterday, literally hours ago, that was called the Broadway Crane Project. And so you should fold a Broadway crane, origami crane you can find online uh, and on yours, whatever you make it out of, a playbill or a piece of paper, whatever, um, you should write your little wish for Broadway's return or a fond theater memory or something, uh, and you should mail it to me. And we're going to collect a thousand of these. We're going to put together, um, you're, you assemble them all on strings, and we're going to put this display together at our gift shop in Times Square when it reopens and just put a little bit of tangible hope out in the world um, for, uh, well, you know, while we don't have as much Broadway in our heart. Um, so I hope you'll join me. Uh, I can't fold a thousand grades by myself, so I need your help. 
All that to say today, uh, why we're really here is the Ambassador Theater is because of this woman who you're going to meet, who you're going to find is an incredible individual, very hardworking. And we're going to find out, finally, put to rest, what does a house electrician really do? This week 17, it's the Ambassador Theater. Um, for today, if you have any questions about Susan's theatrical journey, uh, about anything that we talk about today, drop those in the comments. We'll weave, like we always do, that into the conversation. Um, and if you haven't yet, if you're joining us live, drop into the comments and say hi and let me know where you're from because Facebook. Facebook doesn't tell me those things. Um, I love you all. Welcome to Saturday Noon on Broadway. And without further ado, join me in welcoming Broadway's Susan Goulet. Hi, Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm so good. It's so good to see you. Hey, you too. Thank you for dressing up in red. I, I love a good <laughs> themed costume. <laughs> I had to wear my, my Chicago family team colors. Yes. Red and black all day. For what? 23 years? 22 wow. years? How it's amazing. Uh, it's, I it's started amazing. at the ambassador in 2016 and it's already the family that I I depend on and love so absolutely. Oh without. my gosh. I mean, it's just it's been so hard to be away from them. Yeah. I, um, I was reading, I woke up today and I did what you should never do. I checked my email before I got out of bed because I'm an awful human. Welcome to <laughs> my life. I'm sure lots of you can commiserate. We shouldn't do it, but we do it. And the but first thing that- looks like that because you stay in bed longer. Oh yeah. He loves that. Except he gets to eat right when we get out of bed. So he's like, get off your email. I'm hungry. Um, but the first thing I saw, and this is again, life just like throwing things at me, knowing that I'm going to talk to you hours later. Um, Brian, one of the ensemble dancers wrote this incredible just, piece in oh. dance magazine. And I was like, who it, I if read you haven't it. read it, it. I it, read it. And I was in tears yeah. from about halfway through the first paragraph until the end it is so beautifully written it is yeah. so honestly written yes and it even though it's from a dancer's perspective it it touches every one of us yeah. in that we w all went through those same stages yep i i was blown away i i he has a new career as a writer i think yeah. he has if he wasn't already um it's just his um his voice is so clear and, and um, it's so I'm funny. Up just thinking about it. No, I yeah. I mean, I'm getting chills. It's so um, it's funny in the sense that I love when people can write funny because writing funny is very hard. And I don't know this human. Um, and I thought, He's oh beautiful. gosh, I, yeah. You finish it, and I was like, I want to like hug you. I want to talk to you. I want to be your friend because you sound hilarious and you're a great writer. And you're just like, oh yeah. Also Broadway, 13 years in Chicago, but also I'm an incredible writer. And you're like, okay, so just be talented at everything. It sounds great. Um, let's talk about before we're going to talk about Chicago. We're going to talk about House Electrician. We're going to talk about everything, but we want to know about you. So tell us about you. Tell us where you're from. Tell us maybe first exposure to theater, maybe first ideas of like, oh, maybe there's a place in that world for me and get us really until you get to New York City. And then we'll start talking about Broadway and light bulbs and lots okay, of- Okay, I'll, I'll try to do the abridged version. Yes. So. Yeah, correct. We only have X amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a, in a small town in Maine. Um, York, Maine is where I went to school, York High School. Um, okay. And in the town, the village actually, right next door to where I grew up was the Agunquit Playhouse, which is a very famous summer stock theater. Um, and at the time when I was 15, um, I had an English teacher who had a season ticket to the playhouse. And she, um, she was an English teacher who also really pushed theater, Shakespeare, um, and she, she motivated me. Her name was Mrs. Hall. And she, um, she was the teacher who said, um, you may be from a small town in Maine, but you need to sound like a professional. So she taught us all how to not have that thick Maine accent. Yes. <laughs> um, and she introduced me to the Playhouse. And after the first season of going to see, I think the very first show I saw there was John Raitt in South Pacific. Come on. Seriously. Ugh. And um, and so I, I went the next summer, well, the, the spring before that next summer, I went and I applied for a job. And the producer, Mr. Lane, who was very, very distinguished and... Um, he would just make you nervous just being in the same room with him. Um, always wore a very fine suit or on opening nights, he always wore a white tux. Um, he, he agreed to the interview, but then he told me that I was too young. Uh -huh. How and, old were you uh, at this point? I was 16 when I okay. applied 
and the people he was hiring were all college students. Okay. And it was a very, very rigorous schedule. Um, I, I understand his concern, but I wouldn't let it rest. And he finally gave in and he said, okay, I'll, I will hire you as an apprentice, which I've never done before. You okay. will make less than half of what the college students make Great. and you will have slightly less uh, uh, duties around the theater. Okay. Um, and after the first week, he, uh, the, the scenic artist, um, this wonderful man, Daryl Perkins, went to the producer and said, you need to pay her what you're paying those college kids so, because she's working twice as hard as they are. Oh. And I went on to work there for, that was in 1983. And I went on to work there until 1988 and eventually becoming the head prop person. Come on. <laughs> so he, um, he, he got his money's worth. I, yeah, uh, I, I, I would think so, to say the uh, least. You yeah. sound like the Schubert brothers. You read these stories about the Schuberts and they're like, they started and Sam Schubert like handed out playbills and a week later, he was the assistant box office manager. A week after that, he was like counting the till every night. A week after that, he bought the theater and you're like, exactly. okay, so I, I haven't quite gotten to the buy the theater part, but I'm working on it. We're, we're, we're closer. Yeah. Um, my very wow. first show at the Playhouse was they're playing our song with John Hill Milner and Lauren Mitchell. And oh I'm still in touch with both of them. Uh, um, so many friendships were, were started there. And, um, and then that, that led me to meet people who helped me decide where to go to school. Okay. Um, and I ended up going to school in, uh, in Columbia, Missouri, of all places. Sure. Um, I went to Stevens College, um, primarily because they sent me uh, a huge financial aid package of all the schools I applied to. I wanted to go to Princeton. I wanted to go to Emerson, but Steven sent me this huge financial aid package. And I was, um, I was raised by a single mom. Okay. And so financial aid was very important. Yeah. And um, my last year and a half, I was actually on a full scholarship for technical theater. And wow. then um, that program actually focused the, the students in technical theater and design to what was called the ERTAs, the, um, uh, it was the Regional uh, uh, Theater Association. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so I, I just did it because it was a free trip to New York. I could actually <laughs> swing my mom paying for a trip to New York because I had to go to the audition. I didn't really want yeah. to go to grad school, but, you know, why not? Sure. And um, I ended up getting called back by about 20 different programs, and I decided on UMass Amherst. So I went to grad school for lighting design. And after the first wow. year, I discovered that unlike Stevens College, where I had gone to undergrad, um, and it was very production oriented for what it lacked in being in the middle of the country and not yeah. close to New York, it it really pushed doing shows. It was about doing shows. And, and with the technical musicals. side of things, it's like doing, I mean, that's where you're going to, I, th I, you know, it, it, people said, if you want to learn to tap dance, be good enough to book a show. And then you're going to learn to tap dance eight times a week. Yes. Yeah. So when I got to grad school, I was a little bit surprised that there was a lot of sitting around talking about doing shows. <laughs> sure. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, lots of, um, concept meetings. And I thought the concept is to get people in the seats. Correct. You know, I have been in commercial theater. And uh, after a year, I just decided to move to New York. And my very first job in New York was working for the Macy's Parade. Come on. <laughs> I um, I don't know if anyone remembers the the little newspaper uh, that was called Art Search, but I would I was scanning Art Search for a job in New York. And I, I didn't understand that most people went to New York and found a job. I thought you had to have a job to move to New York. Right. So I lined up interviews and I got a job at the Macy's Parade Studio. And I actually was responsible, one of four people responsible for maintaining and flying all the balloons. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. And I love that you're smarter than everyone. The smart option is like, I'll have something when I get there and then I'll get there and I'll just go. The rest of us like are thoroughly modern Millie, like setting down our suitcases, like bling, well, it and did then, like, sort of turn out that way because I went to New York with this interview in mind. And in between the time that I got the interview, another friend of mine, uh, Rich Lotta, who is actually still the lighting designer at the Agunqua Playhouse, he called wow. me and said, I'm doing this show at Musical Theater Works at St. Peter's, uh, Peter's Church in the City Court building. We need a light board operator. Can you start, you know, Saturday at five o'clock? And I got to New York 
with my suitcases at 3.30. <laughs> and you were like, I'll be right there. I'll be right there. So Let me that's print out that my was... map quest directions. Wow. Yeah. So um, uh, I spent several, just maybe two or three years just sort of bouncing around. And after a year at the parade studio and flying around the country, flying balloons, I realized I missed theater and I got a job at the Joyce. Uh huh. And I didn't understand the one thing that Stevens didn't really teach me is uh, about unions. I had really yeah. no idea. So I got the job at the Joyce and I worked with a, the Feld Ballet. And mm -hmm. the following season, the production manager from the Feld Ballet reached out to me and said, I'm going to be work. I'm going to be working with the New York city opera. We're going on tour. Would you be opposed to getting your union card? And I thought opposed hell no. <laughs> right. Um, I'm ready. So I got my union card and I went out uh, with a uh, 63 city um, tour of Marriage of Figaro. Wow. And, and in the world, union job. That's crazy. In the world of unions is because in, in the actor side of things, we talk about it a lot. And, and students now, everyone's so savvy. I was not savvy when I moved to New York City. But all these kids now with social media, they see everything. They know all the terms. They know all the things. And they know what to ask. And they always say, okay, when should I take my union card? So for the actor side of things, it's very... You know, this is a big decision because it preclude, precludes you from doing so many other jobs that are non-union yeah. that could be jobs that are stepping stones, you know, and to, and to building a career. Um, so a lot of times it's like, don't take it right away. Is it the same on the tech side of things? Is it a similar thing? It, it, it is if you immediately enter local one, which is the, the, the local that is the jurisdiction of New York City, Broadway, television, um, NBC, ABC, things like that. But sure. for me, I joined the international, which is the overall umbrella of okay. the um, theatrical stagehand union, um, which which is um, it, it oversees all of the locals. And I actually my very first card, which, you know, still has a little bit of uh, negative uh, feel to it by, for <laughs> sure. some people, but I got an ACT card, which meant that I didn't have a home local. I was just sort of adopted into the international and given the right to tour, but okay. I didn't have any home base. And I had that card and people told me, well, when you're out on the road, try to try to get friendly with the locals because maybe one of the locals will adopt you and you'll get into a, a local and then that's better. And I thought, well, that, that seems a little bit icky to me. I didn't like the idea of sort of manipulating the situation. And, but sure. I was in state college, Pennsylvania, and I was doing props at the time, even though I'm a house electrician now. And, um, the head prop person said, what local are you in? And I was a little embarrassed and shy. And I said, Oh, I I'm just in, the, you know, I have an ACT card. And she said, um, you're in good shape here, right? Can I, I I'm just going to go talk to someone and I'll be right back. So the next thing I knew, the president of the of 636 in State College, Pennsylvania, was talking to me. And she said, if you would be able to come and do the load-ins that we need extra people for, we would love to have you in our local. Oh, so it just sort of it. happened. Yeah. And for many years, I was a member of 636. And then in 1995, I took my local one apprenticeship te test, um, okay. which they hadn't done in quite a few years. It was the first time. So about 500 people took the test. I've heard about this test. <laughs> it was in a hotel. It was, I think it was in the Sheraton hotel. I'm not, that I may be in, that may not be right, but I think it was in the Sheraton and okay. it was this huge room just full of people taking the test. And, um, they only took out of the 500 people, give or take, they took the top 40 scores. Okay. And the top 40 scores were placed into apprenticeships as they became available. And I scored, I think, 14 out of 500. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> I, only because I got, I, I found the book and I studied the book and I just took the test. Because yeah, you're smart. You're, it turns out you're really smart. <laughs> um, I'm stubborn and I, and I, yeah. and I put my mind to things and I won't give up. So that really yeah, is. Stubborn and smart is a, um. It, get out of your way if, if that's a combination. <laughs> I was like, I there's moments where I'm like, these are the perfect two adjectives to combine and everyone move out of my way. So I, I started my apprenticeship uh, with the Roundabout Theater when it was still in the Criterion Center, which for a long time is where the Swatch store was. And now, yeah. what are they it's doing now? now? Um, it's the, the Old Navy and the Gap. 
Yeah. So um, you did? I did fabulous shows for the roundabout. What shows do you? Uh, I did the rehearsal with Roger Reese. Uh huh. Um, I did uh, Company, the revival. Oh, come on. With, no. With Boyd with Gaines. Boyd Gaines and, and Jane and Krakowski. And, and, and Deborah and Monk and LaShawn's. Wasn't LaShawn's in that? Yes. Come and, on. And yes, LaShawn's, Charlotte. It was the most amazing company. And John Hilner. So my my career. No, I love all that. Came back together. Yes, it was. Oh, it was I had no idea. To and do. so that was their first. Those were considered Broadway. That was their first Broadway house, right? It was an old. It was their first Broadway house. They were eligible. Yeah, movie for theater Broadway. converted. Right, 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 right. Yep. And then it flooded or there was some, there was all kinds of stuff that went on and it was kind of a mess. I'm not and that's sure what why happened they... after, I, after I graduated from my apprenticeship. Sure. Um, I know they did a few more shows, but it wasn't, it wasn't terribly long. But before I even left, they were developing, they were starting to renovate the Amer what became the American Airlines Theater. Okay. Um, but then my, my path separated from the roundabout for several years and I became more of, um, I, I was the head electrician on Annie, get your gun for a while. Um, I was the Verilite tech on the original Ragtime. Um, wow, come on. I did, uh, I was the head Susan, electrician. I had no idea. <laughs> I was on the, I was the head electrician on Hollywood arms for a little while. Um, with Carol Burnett, was that it? She was, she, it was her life story. <laughs> She actually yeah. took us out for our closing uh, party. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then all, and then my first, actually after my apprenticeship, my first big Broadway contract was as the uh, head follow spot operator on Jekyll and Hyde, the original Jekyll and Hyde. My favorite. Don't even get me started on Jekyll and Hyde. We will do an hour of just Jekyll and Hyde. It's uh, it seemed, it just keeps coming back into my life. It's um you know, Frank is, um, is one of those people who he writes music that just stays with you. So yes. You know. And he's loyal to his people, which I love. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I went on to do a uh, diary of <clears throat> Natalie Portman and I, I, I did a bunch of shows and then I settled, I settled in, um, you know, nine 11 happened, some crazy things happened. Yeah. Um, and we bounced back and, um, I did the revival of Into the Woods with Laura Benanti, who is one of my favorite people on the planet. Yes. Um, At the Broadhurst. Yes. And um, and then I was, um, and then I did Nine the Musical, which brought <gasps> me was... back to the roundabout. Yes. And that was one of the first things I saw. It changed my life. And Laura Benanti again. Laura Benanti, yes. who uh, we at that point had done a couple of shows together. We had a bonding um, experience because she had had uh, disc fusion surgery. And during yeah. the course of nine, I actually ended up needing the same surgery and ended up going to the same surgeon that she went to. Um, she came to my apartment after the surgery with a big teddy bear and all the things that she knew I would need, like smoothies. And <laughs> sure. um, so the, the Broadway community has seriously been my, my family for a very long time. Um, but the roundabout connection ended up bringing me to the American Airlines because after nine closed, they were looking for a new house electrician. And they reached out to me because they they were really appreciative of my work on nine. Even though I yeah. wasn't the original uh, head electrician, I replaced David Carlson, who had done a fabulous job, but went on to do another show. Um, okay. So they hired me to be the house electrician at the American Airlines. And I stayed there through 12 Angry Men Oh, I love that production. And then I was able to, um, I was asked to do Little Women on Broadway. Oh, my and heart. That production actually brought me back to a little bit of a connection to my college experience because Jana Robbins was one of the producers and uh, she was a guest artist at Stevens College. And that's how I met her when I was 17 years old. Gosh. And Lauren Mitchell was also a producer. So it brought me back to my first show at Agunquit. It was like everything came together with Little Women. And then during I, Little Women, I love it. During Little Women, I got the phone call from the Schuberts. That wow. changed my life. Yeah, I was gonna say, and that seems to me where it's like that every all of this is preparing for like just your epic what I know as Susan now, which is like <laughs> woman in charge killing it, like basically owns the theater district. Oh, when goodness. I was like, oh we got to bring her on, I was like 
not enough people know about Susan. I was I, like, you're going to the mayor I'm turning of, red, Tim. I think the I can mayor of it. Times Square, Susan, just screwing in light bulbs here and there. Just, oh, it's Susan. She owns Broadway. She's just basically, her middle name is Schubert. So um, <laughs> this is crazy. I, um, and for those that are watching, what I love about um, our industry and you hit it on the head is, is the community. And you, 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 you touched on nine 11. I think we're in another one of those, these moments uh, for a community having to kind of muscle its way through. And I've been thinking a lot about the great depression because this is what I do. Welcome to my weird historical life. And in the, in, in the great depression, uh, the Schubert's everyone, you watch the whole industry kind of change. Um, and I think we're in another one of those moments. And I think the only way you really get through those moments is the community and these people that you end up working with multiple times and you build these circles. And I was like, you know, this, the thing about a circle is it's continuous. And so you just have to find your way in that circle and use that community to get yourself out of the this this moment we're in. So I, I'm obsessed with all of the connections and all of the circles in your life make me um, very happy. With that said, this is what Tom says. We love Tom. He says, company is in my top five and the recording from that roundabout production is my favorite cast recording of it. Um, it is a great recording. Yeah, it's uh, it's so good. And then Caitlin says, thank you, Susan, for keeping Broadway lit. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Which I love. Um, okay, so talk to us. Okay, before we talk about the Schuberts, talk to us about what the role of a house electrician does. Like a day in the life of you working at the Ambassador, you show up to work, and then what do you do? I get to the theater about an hour on a on a perfect day when I'm not, <laughs> you know, doing a million other things. I get to the theater about an hour before the rest of my crew, which is okay. yet an hour and a half before the show. So about two and a half hours before showtime. And I walk the theater and I make sure that the all the lights on the marquee are lit properly, any light on the exterior of the building first and foremost, because that's the first place the audience sees. And it's also yeah. the first place that becomes less accessible as the audience starts to gather. And I make sure that's all done. And then I go inside and I do the auditorium and I do the same thing. I walk the auditorium. I make sure that the aisle lights are lit. Um, it's a safety issue first and foremost. Um, and then make sure that every light bulb and every sconce, every chandelier is lit because then it's less about safety, but really more about the aesthetic of the theater and making sure it looks top notch. Yeah. Um, and from that point, I usually, once I know that everything is set, um, it's it's usually about the time for the rest of the crew to come in. And we, what we do, what we call powering up, which is we turn all the power on for lighting, carpentry, props, et cetera. And everybody starts going through the routine of checking everything on the show to make sure it's ready for curtain up. Okay. And it means doing a light check of every light. And I oversee the crew um, there is a, an electrician who is hired by the show, who is responsible for maintaining the show, but I am responsible for making sure that the crew that is supplied by local one is there to facilitate anything that that head electrician needs. needs. And I do things like make sure that when we use the genie, that it is used the safest way with all yeah. the legs in and on a level surface. And I make sure that if there's a ladder, that there's someone standing at the bottom of the ladder. And yeah. I make sure that if someone comes on stage, like if a musician is subbing in and they don't necessarily know the schedule that we ask them to, we, we try politely to ask them to wait until we're finished because we don't want to drop anything on their head. Um, yeah. Just little <laughs> things like that. I'm sort, that. Of, I'm sort of um, the person who oversees what's going on to make sure that nobody sort of doesn't see the obvious and does something that could be dangerous or, you know, um, yeah. and then I'm also just there to lend an extra hand if necessary. Um, once the checkout is done. Um, and this checkout, like on Chicago, that's been there for 23 years, they still do this every show, even though absolutely. it's been the same. Yeah. Great. Crazy. We have a say, we have a saying it's uh, every light, every night. Oh, and I love it, that. And We're it, putting that on a t-shirt. Don't yeah, threaten me with light, the good merchandise. It's, it's um, you know, we, you may have a, a light in a show that, you know, nobody in the world would notice it was out except for you because you know, but um, yeah. the audience wouldn't know or, right. but we consider every light essential. And so it's every light, every night. 
Oh. And so we check and make sure they're all working and we make sure, I mean, unless it's something absolutely impossible. And then what we would do is we would go to stage management and we would say, you know, we have an issue that we can't solve in the time given and we may arrange to come in earlier the next day. Mm -hmm. um, but on Chicago, it's pretty straightforward because of the age of the show, the technology is actually quite simple. And okay. um, we have moving lights, but they are um, moving lights from 20 <laughs> three years ago, <laughs> Correct. Uh, which, which can make it actually harder to maintain yeah. them because they require a little more TLC. Uh -huh. But um, but for the most part, it's um, pretty straightforward. And, and because then, everyone knows the show so well, um, it it makes it a little simpler to, um, to fix things because everything has been fixed at least 10 times before. <laughs> right. So, yeah. There's um, uh, no so new problems. Get, yeah, and then the, the other problem. responsibility I have is making sure that my crew gets paid. So I, I am responsible for doing the payroll and making sure that um, um, the people that are in the theater every day are the people who are credited for being at the theater every day. So I have to, um, uh, at the end of each week, turn in payroll to the house manager. And it has to be accurate because if, it, if I don't turn in an accurate payroll, then the follow spot operator gets the wrong check and that could be devastating if it's the follow spot sub who only had one show that week. Wow. So it's, um, it, it's something that seems very simple, but there's actually a lot of responsibility with that. And then I also do things like once a month, I make sure that all the emergency lighting is working and I test it and the actors and the, and the rest of the crew in the theater usually make fun of me because I make an announcement and then the lights are going on and off and, <laughs> And, uh, and I'm running around the theater trying to do it, you know, so that it doesn't affect people as they're working, but, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, and also I'm, I'm the interface between the technical needs of the theater and the Schuberts who are the theater owner. Mm -hmm. So if there's something that needs to happen in the theater, that's, that's a larger project, for example, than what we could fix in a daily, on a daily basis, yeah. then I would contact the head of the facilities department and say, you know, we have this issue. Um, yeah. we need to solve it. How do we solve it? And, and I interface with them. So it, it, it's multifaceted. When I was yeah. at the booth theater, it had mm -hmm. a whole different aspect because at the booth theater, we did smaller shows. And yeah. instead of having a different electrician hired by the show, I actually did both positions. Really? Yes. Is that rare? Is it because it, the theater's small? Why that? It's, it's actually fairly common. Um, okay. it, it in the, in the theaters where we do smaller shows, well, smaller shows is not exactly the right term. Because it's not, sometimes <laughs> what seems like a small show is not right. a small show. When we yeah. did Glass Menagerie, that was oh not my. a small show. No, we t I tell that story about you and the water and the ghost light and people are like, what? I was like, you have no idea what her life is like. It is insane. And that, yeah, have that's you, a tiny, told, a small show. Have you told this, you've told the story on here about the ghost light? Oh, yeah, yes. I mean, I'm going to have you tell it um, well, the, from the, the horse's mouth. We have to hear it. was surrounded by water. And yeah. so in order to get on stage, you had to go to the basement and up a very narrow staircase, which I always thought, you know, when Cherry and, and Zachary Quinto were going up and down those stairs, I always felt for them. But I I had a very difficult time. The first few time, times I tried to do it with the ghost light in my hand, I, I was I just thought this is dangerous. I'm going to trip and fall and something's going to happen. So I actually rigged a ghost light that would fly in from above. And um, so from the light board position on stage right at the end of the show, I would actually just lower in the ghost light and turn it on. And I would try to do it when there are a few people left in the audience because it always uh, it always got kind of a, a little bit of a notice. It was kind of yeah. Fun. I mean, it was the grand reveal. Moment. Um, I love that story. And I love, I saw you after the show. You were like, I didn't know you were here. Wait, I have to show you something. I was like, <laughs> I love that. I know I, my affinity for ghost lights is very clear. I know. I know. Oh, I love that. Um, and so then your job at the end of the night is whatever hanging ghost light or not to set the ghost light. To set the ghost light. Yes. And that is, the, that is true. Whether I'm the house electrician or acting as both the show electrician or house electrician, the last thing I would do after shutting all the power down is put the ghost light on uh, ghost light on stage, center stage and plug it in. And it is, there's so much controversy about what the ghost light is for and where it came from. But in this day and age, it's really about safety. 
Um, yeah. It is sometimes the only light that's on in the theater. Um, right now, with the theaters being dark, literally, um, I've gone in a few times and um, the house lights are off, the aisle lights are off. The only light is the ghost light. And if it wasn't on, someone could fall off the edge of the stage quite easily. Yeah. Right. Into and that so it, it really is the, extra pit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, that protects us all. Yeah. You look at it as safety and then I come along and I was like, I know, but also there's superstitions. It's so cool. <laughs> and when I was at the Belasco, because I was the house electrician at the Belasco for three years. I didn't um, know that. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know that. I know Carlos over there or he was over there. Maybe he's not over there. Yeah. Um, he, I was about three electricians ago. Okay. Um, and I was there before the renovation. So I was, I was definitely in the, in the, Oh gosh. Yeah. God yeah. bless so you. I spent a lot of time in the Belasco apartment. In fact, Come I on. filmed a uh, ghost hunters episode in the Belasco apartment. <gasps> you did? Yes. You should look that up. There's a, yeah, I'm going to have to, I've never found that or seen yeah. that. Um, Boston Rob from okay. Survivor was one of the hosts and we went in early in the morning and we were there all day long filming and they were, they were using their little um, EMF indicators right. and they got all excited at one point because they were, they were getting readings. And I said, no, that's, those are the house light circuits. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 this is really old. And I said, yep. Yes. 1907. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's incredible. Oh, I'm obsessed. I don't, I, I'm, I'm learning so much. Um, Tom has another question. He says, have you ever had to problem solve or troubleshoot an issue in the middle of a show, oh, either absolutely. proactively or reactively? Fancy Both. Tom, nice adverbs work. <laughs> Both. Um, a, a typical in the middle of the show problem can sometimes just be a color scroller. Um, okay. There is a there is a, a gel uh, roll that it lives inside a box and it and it goes from one color to another and it has a motor and like anything with a motor it can fail but when a color scroller fails it can flap because if one end becomes untaped from the cylinder ah, sure. um, it just keeps spinning and it it has happened to me a few times it happened to me once during any get your gun with with poor Bernadette Peters singing on stage and we couldn't get to it. And we, we just, we were like, I, I was ready to get Annie, get Annie's gun and shoot it <laughs> I was, I, because it's very noisy. So that's a, that's sort of um, a less, it's not about danger so much as it is about, you know, the show is suffering because you hear this flapping noise. Um, sure. I've had people say that they smelled smoke and we've had, um, we've had, equipment that we had to find in the middle of the show that was on the balcony rail and it, it happened to be the um what we call the the brains of the the moving lights and it was just this interface box that the circuitry had started to to fry but it smelled like something was burning and it yeah. i mean it was burning but it was just sort of more annoying but we had to walk through the audience very calmly and try to figure out what it was so that we could take, we could turn the power off and get the smell to go away. Wow. You're yeah. And you're the whole time you're like, is the theater about to burn down? Oh gosh, we've got to, well, that's you know. usually not the first thing that comes to my mind. But, <laughs> that's uh, why I'm an actor. And that's why you're who you are <laughs> because I'm like, the theater will burn down. We need to get this. Everyone remain calm. And you're like, it's a fried circuit. We're all going to be fine. Too. We're going to, we're going to go with the, the least, <laughs> You know, we were prepared for the worst and then, but we know that it's probably something simple that we have to fix. So we keep our heads on. Yeah. I'm going to stay on this side of the lights and uh, I'm going to keep you there. And I think it should all work out. I it just occurred to me as you talk about this and Tom asked this question in hand to God, were you at the booth when the guy plugged the I phone? I was running in? the light board and I sat stage right. So I literally saw him on the monitor get up and I said uh, I was I had the stage manager I said what's going on why is there a guy on the stage and then I I could actually peek around the proscenium and see it and um we had a, a prop guy um who was on the other side of the stage who basically just said you know I'm gonna just go get this guy and yeah. um, and so I was there in the moment as it was happening and there was a lot of um 
there was a lot of backlash. There were a lot of people who were um, saying that the producer staged it for some publicity stunt. And I can say with all certainty, um, it was not a stunt. It was a drunk guy with his friends who had been up the street drinking before the show. And he, his phone was dying and he sort of thought, you know, I need to charge my phone. Where's there an outlet? And his buddy was like, well, there's one on stage. Why don't you use that one? And it was a bit of a dare. And um, um, <laughs> frankly, he was just a jerk. Yeah, and sure. he, um, so he thought the outlet on stage was a good place. So he just hopped right up there and plugged his phone in. And of course it was an outlet to, to nowhere. Right. And um, my, my favorite moment was um, a couple of days later, the set designer um, came in and had one of those little safety plugs that you put in for child. And he, yeah. he put, and he put them in into the outlet. Yeah. It's pretty oh fun. my gosh. That is hilarious. Just in case we have yeah. a repeat of anyone else thinking they needed just a quick little charge. This is, you are so wonderful. Um, you have great stuff. I want to keep you here all day. I was like, no, don't go away. Let's uh, let's <laughs> hang out. Uh, let's talk very quickly and let's wrap up and talk about um, what's happening now. Um, you know, I the have, life. Um, I've had the absolute greatest opportunities during the shutdown. Um, uh -huh. The woman who was playing Mama Morton when we when we were actually shut down, Haley Swindle, uh -huh. was um, kind enough to bring me in on some projects that she was working on. And so I've had the opportunity to do some editing for some great nice. video work that she's been doing. I don't know if anyone saw the fantastic Barbara Streisand, Judy Garland um, piece that she did, um, yeah. Happy Days. Um, but I was able to do the editing on that. We, we've done some great projects together and she's um, she's sort of kept my lifeline to theater going. She's done sure. a few readings that she's allowed me to read stage direction on just to, to be connected to the business. And because yeah. of that, I've been expanding my home studio um, and sort of putting it out there to my, my network of people to say, if you want to record a, a music video, I have a piano, I have the ability to record and we can do a video. I have the background and you can do um, a, a pretty high quality music video or any kind wow. of, if you want to do a, a pre-tape or an audition, um, I'm set up to do that. So um, I've been working on that during this time. And then a few, just about yeah. two months ago, I realized that with the extension of the shutdown, I needed to just take something very seriously, which was how I was going to pay my bills. And yes. I, I, I poised myself about a year and a half ago and got my real estate license completely unrelated to COVID. Um, but as it turns out, it may be the thing that keeps me going because I've, I've now moved to Palisades, New York, and I'm working okay. in the William Ravis Baron McIntosh office in Nyack and Piermont. And everyone from New York City is moving here. <laughs> yeah, you've probably never been busier. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm really, I'm kind of rebuilding my real estate business because I had been quite successful in the city, but the yeah. city business was dying yeah. and I, I hope it comes back quickly, but I can't pay my bills on that hope. Correct. So I've come to this area, which I was familiar with, but now I'm, I'm hustling to really get to know this area yeah. and I'm in love with this area now. I was going to say, it's a beautiful area. Oh my God. It's yeah. stunning. The old Victorian homes, the new houses, the ability to live on the water, it's and just having green space. Um, yeah, my favorite things is when you post a house and you're like, who wants to give us all money and I'll go in and renovate it? We should all do this. How many times I'm like, oh gosh, when we're on the other side of this and I'm finally rich. <laughs> I have an obsession with uh, restoring houses, and this is definitely a good area to do that in. So if anyone wants to to do that project, I'm ready. But um, yeah, I have um, I have an open house tomorrow in a condo um, at okay. Paramount Landing, and um, I, I showed um, properties yes yesterday or no day before yesterday. I showed rental properties to someone in our business, so right. I'm really hustling and trying to make a go. And That's so you do. I have um, my Instagram is set up for Susan Goulet Real Estate, and my, I have a Susan Goulet Real Estate Facebook page. Sure. And, um, Sort for those of, who are in the market for things, is it just uh, at Susan Goulet Real Estate? Um, you can go to Susan uh, Susan at bearhomes.com for okay. my um, my email, and then it's susan.bearhomes.com for the website. 
Great. Or you can just go to the William Ravis Baron McIntosh site and uh, meet the team and find me that way. Okay, great. I yeah. love that. Go restore some homes and get some homes. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you are a delight. Um, thank you so much for spending a little piece of your Saturday with us. Um, I miss running into you in the neighborhood, but this is this will have to suffice. This is as close as we're gonna get. And I'm like, I guess it. I guess this will count. Um, I have thank to come you. Kidnap you and bring you to the to the water yeah, side. Yeah, you're gonna have to. Yeah, or I'm gonna have to like put something together and record in your studio uh, our new uh, our new jingle for Broadway Up Close or something. I'll work on it. We can do um, that. Every light, every night. Is, every light, every night. I, I'm obsessed. Um, so, someone said you should make it a keychain. I might. Don't threaten me. Uh, I might make it a keychain. Um, it's. Uh, I yeah. I love. I love everything about you. I love everything about your job. I love everything about your energy. Um, so thank you for spending uh, your Saturday talking about some ghost lights, talking about some light bulbs, and um, thank we'll you get for through doing this. What you're doing and thank you for Broadway up close. I think it's a it's a great great way for people to understand what we do and see what we do. And I just appreciate everything that you've created. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of us it takes to get to 8 p.m. Uh, you guys even more so that we never see um, uh, in the dark backstage. But with you, a little more light is what we're finding every light, every night. Susan, you're awesome. Have a wonderful uh, rest of your weekend. And um, we will see you again in the neighborhood on the other side of this. And if any of you run into Susan, give her a wave and say hi to the mayor, uh, mayoress of uh, Times Square. I love you, Tim. I love you. Bye. She's a joy. She is. Uh, oh, gosh. Um, I just think it's so important that you see uh, the people that aren't always front and center on the Chicago, on the beautiful, on the main, you know, wicked page. You know, these are the people that make our business tick. Not to undermine actors, I love them. I am one. We have them all the time. Um, but it's the it's the network. It's the fabric of all of them. It's the people who literally, without a lighting designer, without a house electrician, we are not seen. And of course, it's always about us in the long run. Uh, but um, every light, every night. Uh, I've never heard that. Um, it's for me. It's like the shove with love of actors. But on their end, every light, every night. I'm obsessed. Um, new ideas are hatching in my brain. Um, thank you for joining me as always for this little piece of Saturday. I look forward to it every week. Um, it used to stress me out all the technical aspects of this, but now in week 17, I'm getting a little better uh, at hanging on my couch with um, Belasco, a sleeping French bulldog who is always with me at all times. Of course, my best friend in this shutdown. I hope the news of yesterday isn't completely deflating your life and your day. Um, cry and have your moment. We all did. Uh, and then we go back to work, getting optimistic one day closer. If you uh, have time in your life, this paper crane idea is something a little tangible to get your hands busy, get your mind off it, put your wish out, send it to me in the world. My address um, to send your crane, should you want to be part of this uh, Broadway crane project, uh, is on our Facebook. It's on our Instagram. Look for that main post there. Um, and with that, uh, thank you for joining me this Saturday. Uh, I love you all. Happy Saturday noon on Broadway. And we are officially one day and one paper crane closer to Broadway. I'll see you guys all soon. Bye.